Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. What we have done is, oh, just to kind of put ourselves in perspective, we've done the solar analysis on the Lockwood surface, and we use the list map to vary some input parameters. Let's go ahead and take a look at that example, because I think we're really right at the edge of being able to do something interesting to pull it all back together, where I have this surface evaluate solar potential. I'm getting these cumulative solar insulations. I'm pulling off the list map. Watch out. I made the mistake first of pulling off the um, node itself, function, and it just says function. OK, so the watch is actually doing that. In terms of grabbing that final value, again, this is just like we did in the roof example. We'll go get the maximum item. Let's kind of get the maximum of that list. OK, then we'll do that. Go ahead. No, it's the find the keys. What is it? List match, find keys. What is it? List.match with key values. Thank you. It's one of those things I can never remember. OK, so the value to match is we're going to value. I'm so glad we changed that name. <laughs> I was like, we're going to match the value, the maximum value. The thing that we're going to match it against is this list. It's the list of all the different values. That's going to tell us where in that list it is. And then in that list, we're going to basically say, let's go through and return which of the different wave amplitudes gave it to us. So that's going to ultimately now return the value 1, okay, which is actually true. So it looks like, and it sort of makes sense. When you're varying the waviness of something, often the case is that the wavier it gets, the uh, oh, sort of self-blocking things. Things are sort of uh, locking itself. And generally, a flat surface does do pretty good. So we will go through and say, if that is the value, hopefully your uh, surface is a little more interesting than mine, we can say, let's go ahead now and do something a little bit different. I'm going to copy that original value over here. Okay. And I'm going to pull in that as the wave amplitude. Okay. That would go ahead and solve it just for you know, this one value. So as opposed to doing with a list map, go ahead and do it for the key value. Now, if people would like to display the surface and do all those sorts of things, you can pull out of this function anything you want to. So in the same sense, I kind of knocked a lot of stuff out. If I edit this custom node, I can add some more exports to it. For example, if I want to get that surface so I can panelize that surface and do all that type stuff, or display the uh, color values on the surface, what I can do is just in this node, What I do with my node? Edit that custom node. There it is. Okay. Basically, add some more outputs to it. If I want to get the surface, here's the output for that. I'll just drag that over there. Just change its name. OK, that was my lofted surface to be analyzed. Great. So that's an output now. I can go back over here. See, it's actually one of the outputs over here. So I can pull that surface out now and use that to do the panelization. In fact, so let's go back over here. You might remember over here, I had left a bunch of junk up in the corner. So I can take, oh, let me pull this stuff down. I 
Look at it. You. So after I recreate the surface, my new improved lofted surface that matches the optimal values, I can pull that in and just go over it and panelize it. Or colorize it or anything else that you want to do to it. Same thing, that surface is now a surface, so in terms of those grid values and all that type of stuff, we could you know, use the display function the way you, you, know, you want to within the solar node and do it for that one function. Okay. Let's pause there. I'm just kind of see if that sort of makes sense, because that is really the essence of what you're going to need. Kind of making sense, more or less. Need a little practice. It's always that. Yeah, it always sort of works when you, uh, or yeah, you know, like the rub always comes when you're like uh, trying to apply it to your own, and little things are going wrong. But let's go ahead and just kind of compare though this first issue about search strategies and. I'm going to show you some really quick examples for how you can start applying this in sort of a more generic form or in other forms that are probably a little more powerful. Okay. 13.3 is actually a very simple example. It's just really using a list map to flex a simple box. And simple boxes are really good that given a height and a width, uh, you know, length, you can sort of guess what the volume is going to be. And Revit's a very good calculator. So Revit's very good at calculating surface areas. It's very good at creating volumes, uh, mass floors, all that kind of stuff. So 13.3 really just starts by taking a very simple box and flexing it as we go through and change the height. 13.4 is actually very, very similar. It just says we're going to use a slightly more complicated mass, something which looks like a tower that twists around a little bit. But again, we're just going to go through and vary one of the inputs and always go through and set the input value or transaction start, set a parameter, transaction end, then get some values back at the back end of it. Okay, so those two actually work hand in hand. 13.5, where we're going to get to, is it takes the idea of really not only having a single value, but what if you actually have two things you want to change at the same time? and exploring along two different dimensions. So if I want to not only change the height, I also want to change the width at the same time. It sort of just expands our search space. Okay, but list map is going to do it exhaustively either way. So let's start with this, the simple one, 13.3. It's basically going to flex the element by always transaction starting, element set parameter by name, transaction ending, and then we get the results so if it's a value off of the Revit element that's being computed, we'll say element get parameter by name. So it kind of works that way. We're going to go through and, oh, we can get a bunch of Excel values and write them out to Excel. But let's just go ahead and start with this first part, just you know, kind of flexing something and returning it. So if you can with me, join me. Where am I? Let's go over to 13.3. Now let's take a look at that. Thirteen point three. We're going to take a simple box, and this box is so simple. I know you intuitively are going to be able to predict everything about its behavior, which is good. Because if you can't do that, then it's easy to get lost in all the math and the, the programming. So check out that box. That's a very simple little box element. I'm going to push it over to the side just a little bit so we can kind of keep our eye on it when we're working Dynamo. So I went a little too far. Try that again. So here's what we're after on our little box. Our box has some different input parameters. It has width, height, depth. That's all kind of good. Notice it also has some other interesting values, gross surface area and gross volume. Those you'll see are grayed out right now. Those are reported. We don't actually put those in. Those are values we can get out. 
So to make this really straightforward, go ahead and make it just a width of 10 and a depth of 10, because you'll know the results you expect then, then the gross volume would be something around 5,000. Okay, really easy for you to sort of remember. Okay, so super, the idea is as we go through and change it to 20, we hope that'll be 2,000, and that's what we're after. We're really just trying to sort of flex something very simply and say, great, if we went through and just changed the height of, picture now some big tower you're building in San Francisco on the waterfront, or you have a Transbay tube or something like that, you're gonna change the height, and we're gonna keep track of how the volume is changing. And we can also keep track of how the surface area is changing. We can divide those things together and kind of figure out some ratio between them. But we're just gonna really quickly start changing a shape. So to do that, let's go ahead and open up in our nearby Dynamo scripts. Let me see which one I'm going to recommend you start with, because we can kind of dive into this one a little bit further in. Let's go through and open up. Where do I want to be? Let's go through. To, let's go to one A. That's fine. Let's go ahead and figure out how this works. The idea is we've gone through and have created a little custom function. The custom function takes some element, okay, has an input of the height value, and then it ultimately just pulls out a surface area. So let's kind of think about what's actually inside of there. I think I close this up over here. I'm going to pull that over just so we can sort of see them together. Okay, so the idea is we're going to get the element. Beautiful. Inside of this function, if you edit that custom node, it has this very kind of common way of looking at it. So we have some inputs, the element itself and the height value that's going to be tested. Whenever we're setting the transaction, whenever we're changing the red element, it always is set parameter by name, but we need to do transaction start and transaction end so that it'll actually update the element. Okay, so we're going to give it a height value, set its parameter by that name and ultimately regenerate. So that'll kind of make it flash over here in Reddit. The back end of this function is what do you actually want to return? I could just pass out the element itself. That's what the output updated element is. Just send me the updated element. That's fine if you're going to do something externally. If you want to actually return one of these parameter values, like the surface area, I'm going to say get parameter value by name and return that for a surface area. But it's very important I have to do the transaction end so that I get the updated one, not the one coming in. Okay, so let's just give that a try. In terms of the list, I have a list map over here. The list has values 10 through 50 by 10. So bring that over to the list. We'll bring over if height value is the thing that is left open, that will be the whole view plugs. Well, let's pull out the um, element surface area as the f of x. And we'll see what those look like. So I'll go ahead and that's the list. The thing that I want to pull out is the surface areas. Give it a run. Not too awfully bad. Now, you'll notice in terms of my output values, I've got a little bit of gooberiness going on here. I've got this 599.99999 and 9.99. It's a little bit rounding here around the edge. Okay, But for the most part, let's see if it makes sense. 10 by 10 by 10, or out of, no, not sure. Oh, I'm doing surface area. Pardon me, I was thinking of doing volume. You're right. <laughs> I can change it to volume. In fact, we'll change it to volume in just a second. We're going to do two different variables. So this is actually going through and doing the surface area. So you can kind of do it, compare it if you want to see. It should be for 50. Let's see if it actually matches the same thing. We've got height of 50. It's reporting the surface area of 2,200. That looks like it's doing the same thing. Okay, for the next one, in terms of actually returning multiple values, let's think about how you can do that. 
Maybe she'll just do it here. We'll make it together. What I want to do is basically return not only the surface area, I'd also like to get that volume back up too. Okay, and here's the deal. As you're doing a list map, you can only return one thing at a time. Okay, but I want to return two things. But I can only return one thing, but I really want to get two. So what you got to do is take the two and stick them in a list and return the list of things. Okay, so let's see what that would look like. If you edit this thing over here, okay, we're not doing too bad. A little gross surface area action there. That's okay. I want to get that gross volume too. So what I can do is take these two, copy, okay. I would also like to get your gross volume right here. If we were just going to approach it very simply, we might do it. But if I want to get both of those things out, as opposed to just getting a single thing out with element, surface area, open volume, what I'm going to do is just do a little list create action, and I am going to beat the system. So I'll say list.create. Slide that over. Let me go ahead and I will get that and that, and I'll put that to an output. And put that over there. Okay, get the idea of what I'm doing? Okay, the reason I'm trying to do it like this is I could go through and run the whole loop and get all the areas, and then go back and run the whole loop and get all the volumes. And that involves running the whole loop twice. And as long as I'm updating everything in Revit, I might as well grab everything I can for every regeneration possible. So I'm going to get both the volume and the area. So if I come back over here, I got this. Nice looking function. And now, look at it. Ooh, we got choices. So here's what it is. You basically choose what it is you want. Whether you want the volumes, the surface areas, or both. And plug that in. So if I want to get them both, let's pull that out. So I see you got the surface areas and the volumes kind of hanging around in there. Super. So with a little work, I can transpose that list around. I can get it together with these input values and create a nice grid of values that I'm going to export to Excel. There's a lot of things I could do with these, but that's basically you know the two different values that we want. And this is really the basis for a lot of things we're going to do now, is where we go through and change a single input value and then pull different values out, different sort of things we'd like to test. Okay, so you can start that with something as simple as this. Let me kind of show you what the next example is about, but I'll just kind of leave it hanging in there for you to play with if you want to. See if it's even in there. Pull that down over here. Do you have anything in there? So this is my mass families. Just the box so far. Okay, the next example is ever so similar what it does is it actually just pulls in a slightly different mass because this little box, you know, we've been walking. That's kind of interesting, but we'd actually like to run. So let's go back out to session 13 and pull in something a little more interesting. It's actually in 13.4, but we'll just pull it in there. I have a couple of different masses. I have a twisting rectangular mass. The twisting rectangular mass has a lot of parameters. Okay, we can raise the height, we can do the rotation. Pushing triangular mass is even more interesting still. It kind of kind of looks like the Shanghai Tower. We'll just go to the twisting rectangular mass. OK, 
Okay, I'll pull my twisting rectangular mass in here instead. Oops, looks like I have to go through and grab a single instance of it. Well, a little different in scale. So we can go through and do the same sort of analysis now on this. Now, this mass is actually a little more interesting because it's a little harder to predict what the volume of that thing is as we twist it or we change its height. With a simple box, it was really easy because you know that was just sort of simple math. This is where Revit's a really good calculator. And as you start thinking about different building forms and how you get the total amount of square footage you need on the side and the different constraints that bound you, okay, you can start playing with a form like this pretty easily. We can change and point to that form instead. The values of what's changeable on it, though, it's not just height. We have twist. We have building top, building top depth building height, building base width, building depth. So you can play with a lot of these things over here. For example, if you want to say, what would happen if it's a 300 foot tower? You can look at that. If you want to say, oh, what if the twistiness at the top wasn't 45, it was only 30 degrees? What if the twistiness at the top was, oh, let's try 80 degrees. You'll find buildings like that being built today. Actually, famous ones that are being built today that look like that. You could also go through and try, oh, for example, if you like the idea of a pyramid structure, we can make it fat at the bottom and small at the top. Or if you want to think about something that has, oh, kind of a funny shape, let's try this. We have all sorts of forms. That's where we're going next, and we'll continue there next time. It's really the idea that simple masses, simple boxes, that was easy. But now let's go ahead and do something a little more interesting and use the same infrastructure, pull those values out. And this is where we're going to start having an awful lot of flexibility to use this list mapping to try a whole range of different forms that might fit on the website. And that way, we can get from area or volume, we can now evaluate the solar potential of the faces, we can now evaluate the energy being used by that building form. So, a lot of different things. So, that's what's coming up next. Okay, for office hours, if you need help with the assignment, come on by this afternoon. Uh, we should be here from 3 30 onward. Okay, until so probably like 7 30 or something like that. I have a question about the example. Mine didn't work. Well, let's come over and see. Let me go ahead and uh, stop the recording and we will come over and see.